I'm going to quickly, I'll quickly introduce myself. My name is Rajesh. I work with the engineering for research team at ThoughtWorks in, in Pune. And within that, we, we do something called, that's called data intensive computing. We work in that area. And, I, and I'm going to tell you about that very soon of what, what exactly that, uh, that means. With that, uh, I'll, I'll hand off to Justin, let's, if you could introduce yourself. Hi, uh, I'm Justin. Uh, so within A4R, I work on multiple things and data intensive computing. Uh, within data intensive computing, I work under the astrophysics project, which we are currently handling. And I would be talking about uh, astrophysics project, the Arctic project, which we are doing as part of this presentation. Over to you, Rajesh. Thank you. All right. So, so we, with that, um, I'm going to give you a bit of a background on the on what is uh, data intensive computing. So you're going to have to bear with me. Uh, this is going to be a little bit uh, background to how we got got to this point. Uh, uh, could you move to the next slide, please? All right. So uh, data intensive computing is called the fourth paradigm of uh, scientific uh, discovery. And uh, why the fourth paradigm? Because we've got three others uh, and traditionally, uh, traditionally, how data and uh, how scientific discovery has been uh, done has been, you know, using using various methods. And you've got uh, you've got empirical uh, you've got the empirical paradigm, which is primarily based on uh, experiments and uh, observations. Uh, you would know about theoretical science, and uh, through the fact that we've got theoretical physics, uh, we've got everyone from Newton and to Einstein who who you know done so much work in that area. And uh, then we have, uh, as we approach uh, towards getting where, where we started getting computers to do some of the work for us, we have also got simulated science, right? Uh, and this is primarily based on uh, modeling and simulation to explain uh, nat uh, you know, a natural phenomenon. And uh, this, of course, you, uh, uses, uh, uses computers uh, as well. But then suddenly what has, what has happened in the past few years has been what we call as the increase in the number of, uh, you know, increase number of observations that, we've, that we have been making. And these observations are primarily coming from, you know, advances in sensors, advances in, you know, uh, different instruments that we use to record. And it has also led to collection of vast amounts of data, right? And uh, I'll explain in a little bit what that, uh, what that really means. Uh, but there's one thing unique about data intensive uh, data intensive computing and that is that you you make observations without having a prejudgment or, uh, or you know any bias about what information may be contained within the data itself right so you've got data and through computation through algorithms through your uh, through analysis you glean out what what the data is data is telling, and that's something unique uh, unique to data intensive uh, computing or data intensive scientific discovery. So, uh, Justin, could you move to the next one, please? So, which which are some of the large uh, uh, experiments, right? Uh, in a, specifically in the world of science, uh, when we started or when we started looking at data intensive computing, one of the one of the things was to try and figure out uh, how other organizations have been uh, have been you know doing uh, data intensive science and dealing with you know really really large large amounts of uh, amounts of data and one of the organizations is CERN. Uh, CERN does uh, experiments with the Large uh, Hadron Collider. And as uh, specifically, some of these experiments are the ones you know we've been hearing about, which have been doing the subatomic uh, particle discovery and the Bob's, uh, the Higgs boson particle, etc. Now, the unique thing about this, uh, about what CERN does, is that each experiment of uh, you know their their large hadron collider experiments generate up to close to a 70, uh, 70 or more petabytes of data each year. Uh, there's also twenty five and more petabytes of data that they generate from uh, non uh, lhc experiments and at the time uh, at the time or even till till date these this organization is considered in the science world to be one of the largest producers of scientific observations 
and we're going to look at look at you know some of the techniques that they've they've used uh, to to do that but what is interesting is uh, something uh, something we have been peripherally involved in and something that's up in the in the horizon in the very very short term horizon that's the square kilometer array uh, the square kilometer array is basically uh, radio telescopes that are going to be spread across the globe uh, primarily to start with uh, one of the set of radio telescopes uh, is going to be uh, based out of australia where it, it studies low range uh, frequencies uh, there's another one that's being built in south africa which is going to uh, study uh, frequencies uh, in the range of in in the mid range and basically uh, this entire array of radio telescopes will act like a single uh, large 1 kilometer uh, you know uh, wide uh, uh, radio telescope uh, and i'm and i'm i am probably simplifying oversimplifying this uh, a bit uh, and there might be some terms over here that may be unfamiliar but we can you know you can ask those questions uh, questions later moving on to what date kind of data the sk is going to generate it's uh, we are expecting that when the sk goes live which is very soon that will be about 150 petabytes of data each year and this 150 petabytes of data will be uh, actually taken across to different regional science centers uh, in the world where the science uh, experiments or the science the, uh, the scientific analysis on that data will actually uh, happen and that's that's expected to you know uh, help us uh, look at cell new or discover new celestial objects new galaxies or you know disc or discover some some features about galaxies that we already know about in its prime uh, the square kilometer array is expected to generate about 700 petabytes of data each year uh, now this is all the data that's uh, you know uh, going to have to be that's going to have to be stored somewhere and going to have to be archived somewhere and we are going to have to figure out how we are going to process uh, process this data so moving on to the next slide we basically then just to again give you a context of where we are at in terms of uh, you know compute and and data you can see that you know today we are your our devices like even our mobile devices are capable of uh, doing you know performing uh, ai uh, on on small amounts of data that it that it contains right it it does uh, does that pretty well but as we move towards the right uh, the compute complexity starts uh, starts increasing and in this area you kind of uh, you might still be dealing about you know with me megabytes or even gigabytes of data uh, but that's about you know but that's about the most most you'll uh, do that and basically you'll see cryptography crypto mining and some of these other you know kind of problems that uh, that fit into this uh, this particular area everything above this is what falls into the uh, into the big data or the uh, data intensive space where you might have uh, might have you know computations that are fairly uh, easy to do and maybe even easy to parallelize parallelize and then you move towards uh, problems like what we what some we have been seeing uh, today where the computational algorithms are also quite uh, quite uh, complex where you see a large amount of uh, algorithmic uh, complexity uh, coming in and that's uh, primarily where uh, data intensive computing sits it uh, tries to solve some of the problems in that area Uh, we do have traditional ways by which uh, which this problem has been approached you've been you might have heard about high performance computers or supercomputers but uh, there is a fundamental problem in the way we do computing uh, uh, in in that paradigm uh, which is different from data intensive computing and we we will talk about that as well today um moving on to the next uh, slide i did talk about you know uh, some of the, some of the challenges that we that we are facing in the data intensive uh, computing space and uh, primarily one of them like i said is algorithmic complexity now what is really you know what does it translate what does it really mean in physical terms right one of the things that you see when algorithmic uh, complexity is uh, increases is the sheer amount of time that it takes to process data right and and in here in my slide i have an illustration of what it would take to process 1 gb of uh, data where the complexity is low uh, which is n0 uh, or n1 
and uh, you know that uh, you can process with a one petaflop of compute thrown at it you could probably you know, one petaflop is quite a lot it's close to what you would get in a very very high end uh, uh, computer uh, but you could solve that in within a second as you increase the complexity from there to n cube uh, here's where the fun begins and you know the same amount of data would take 32000 years to you know for that for the data to be uh, that thing to be processed with having the same one petaflop in hand so so here's here's our first first problem the second problem has to do with what is called as uh, arithmetic intensity and uh, and essentially I'll, i may be oversimplifying this but uh, but very simply put how many uh, cpu cycles does it take to process a given data or uh, how many iops does it take uh, between you know that the when you read the data from uh, from storage into memory and then process the data and back again right high arithmetic intensity is probably where we see that you do a lot of computational operations on a single uh, byte of data before before returning it back to uh, you know the storage or or your memory uh, but you also have a problem where you actually perform fewer operations on the same byte of data and what that happens what ha happens there is that you begin to now start uh, reading and writing the data back to memory or storage very very often uh, uh, and and spend less time uh, actually perform compute uh, computing on it and this becomes a very very significant problem when you start uh, dealing with large amounts of data when i'm talking about large amounts we and we when we talk about data intensive we are usually referring to uh, you know uh, data that is in in petabytes petabyte scale uh, scale data so here is where the limitations of our computers and our ability to kind of shovel data between processor uh, the memory storage and uh, you know uh, graphical processing units and different uh, you know components actually happens there are other problems as well uh, simple problems like uh, doing a search on your data become uh, suddenly become non trivial problems where is my data where you, are, you know given you know even if we create a huge amount of storage where we spread your spread our data across multiple hard drives multiple computers multiple uh, storage devices uh, just finding where that data is can can become a very very non trivial uh, trivial problem on in addition to that uh, we've got to some of the data especially in science needs to uh, last more than a human lifetime you want you know uh, as you pro process that data you still want to have to continue to retain the data uh, the experiments and the analysis that was done with that and the results of that so that future scientists and with future techniques can continue to work uh, work on that so like you said this is all non trivial so what do we what do we really do about it and for that i want to go to the next slide and talk about a person we know uh, who is really responsible for i would say uh, bringing the whole data intensive computing about he is a he is a person his uh, name is uh, jim gray uh, jim gray was a computer uh, computer sci scientist who worked at microsoft research um he is uh, he was also been uh, advisor to the government of the united states uh, where he talked about uh, talked about the challenges that uh, specifically uh, sci scientists are going to face as we start facing the data deluge and so jim gray came up with some very interesting laws and some of this uh, is is very uh, very much what what fits with within the thought of each of us but let me start so first you know first is a kind of a postulate he postulated that uh, science is going to become the become uh, increasingly data intensive we already know that it's here it's happening the second postulate is where we really want uh, where we are really changing the way we are going to be doing computing and that's rather than what we've been doing which is we take data from where it is stored and then take it to to somewhere where you perf you perform some you know you write some code you perform some analysis and get results uh trying to do with with you know a petabyte of data is going to be very very difficult to do just 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 think about if you had to read that kind of data from your even from your you know local hard drive uh since you don't have local hard drives that are large enough this is something you're going to have to 
you know, push over your network. And that's a very difficult thing to do. So he said, well, why not push, uh, take our compute or our questions to where the data is sitting, right? Uh, that would make a lot more sense. And the less, rest of the laws are about primarily, you know, decide what, what questions you want to ask about your data and go from, uh, go from working to working. And that's, that's a philosophy that, you know, that we, uh, we follow, uh, not only in uh, uh, E4R, but uh, even in, uh, as something we do in Agile, right? Uh, what's, what's the top most important questions that we need to ask and the, or the top you know, problems that we need to solve? And then we try to work through each of those problems uh, uh, iteratively. All right, with uh, that, Justin, do you, want to, uh, do you want to move on to the next one? So question is, what can we do about, uh, about the computational challenges? Um, and it's not, again, uh, this is, uh, this is, there's no simple answer. Like data and computing is not sim simply about worrying about how to write code or uh, you know, uh, figure out what hardware to use. Uh, but I would say it's it's all of that, right? It, for example, you would start to think, want to think about how to parallelize, uh, you know, parallelize using your uh, using your algorithms or uh, writing algorithms that can deal with parts of the data. Think about it. Your data is not going to fit into you know, into all you know take all of the data, and you can't you can't simply put it put all of it in memory where your uh, where your algorithm can go and you know perform uh, its computation on that. So you really got to figure out uh, well if if I can't put all the data there, uh, then how do I you know how can I break it into small pieces, and if I can actually do perform that kind of you know perform that kind of a computation. There's something which is, and I think this uh, today's talk is probably too short to talk about it, but then there's problems where some of these problems are embarrassingly parallelizable um, on one spectrum. Averages means, you know, top, uh, some of those computations are very, can be very easily parallelized. And then on the other end of the spectrum are uh, problems that you cannot uh, parallelize. And you still have to figure out how you're going to do those when you when you're dealing with large, uh, amounts of data. Uh, I've already talked about what Jim Gray said, take, take your compute to where your data is sitting. And that's uh, that's essentially uh, essentially what you must do. Uh, you've got to re-architect re uh, your computer architecture, your uh, infrastructure architecture to be able to support uh, support that. Um, other few things to, uh, to think about are again, based on, you know, uh, algorithmic, uh, complexity, your arithmetic uh, intensity, uh, you want to, you, uh, you need to start thinking about how you're going to design your hardware subsystems to deal with those problems. Uh, one of the things to try and do is if you're going to be, data is going to move about a lot, even within your uh, system, how can you remove the, you know, in, input output, uh, bot uh, are, you, are you bottlenecks? Uh, we are seeing some advances in that. Uh, Non-volatile memory express is a new type of uh, storage uh, hard disk or a flash storage that that we are that we are seeing, which is uh, about I guess ten times faster than your fastest uh, SSD. You've got high bandwidth memory, where uh, the memory between uh, you know what you're putting in memory and what you're where it's being processed that can be very very fast. And of course, that uh, there's there's a lot that there's a lot more you can uh, you can do it in terms of how do you accelerate your your computation, and there are uh, there are a number of strategies you can uh, you can apply to that. We are seeing uh, the cost of uh, field programmable gate arrays (FPGAs), where you can actually write your algorithm, uh, burn it into a chip, and and uh, and basically uh, do a very, very fast computation at very low energy, uh, very, very well. Uh, you've got GPUs, you've got uh, tensor processing units, which does uh, deep learning uh, and kind of handles deep learning kind of algorithms uh, very, very well. And you can start thinking about building basically hardware that is uh, domain specific to design your uh, hardware from ground up to take advantage of all the technologies that are available to you uh, to solve very very specific uh, specific computational uh, computational problems, so so this is uh, 
uh, this is some you know uh, some of the ways we can approach uh, uh, approach these uh, these problems and like i said this is not this is not uh, you know one solution fits all you got to really look at the big uh, big picture and start uh, start uh, applying which techniques fit uh, those uh, data intensive problems the most uh, the uh, the best can we to the move to the next one all right so we have uh, we have an architectural uh, vision and this is again what i've uh, what i said is it's not just the hardware it's not just the the code that you write it's not uh, simply about one thing or the other it's it's the data and the computing field is uh, encompasses all of it you start fundamentally by by looking at your uh, at the at the kind of uh, hardware infrastructure that you that you build to on which you can run your uh, run your computation and your and perform your storage uh, you need to think about all the subsystems or the software defined storage or you know the other other parts of your infrastructure that will sit on top of this uh, to to help you uh, you know to solve your computational problems in a data intensive manner more importantly uh, again the the software you write of course is a part of it but i think i think the one thing to remember is at the end of the day our job as as in terms of uh, computer computer engineers and uh, computer scientists is to build the tools and the uh, and the instruments uh, that essentially help the scientists do their job right scientists need to focus on on science uh, they really uh, don't want to you know you should be really asking them to spend more and more time or more time writing writing the tools uh, designing the systems uh, for them and and part of our objective uh, and our vision is to help scientists uh, build these tools and uh, build these uh, this infrastructure so that they can solve you know focus on solving the big problems in life uh, there's some uh, justin can you move on the next one so there are some things that we've uh, that some of the experiments that we have run within uh, within thoughtworks uh and uh, those one of them is actually using software defined storage called ceph uh, ceph is something we uh, that cern uses today for storing and compute uh, performing compute on vast amounts of uh, data and uh, we wanted to kind of use that those ideas and see how if we can if we can build uh, uh, clusters that would help us uh, help us perform those kind of computational or do that kind of computation uh, you know in house on on uh, hardware that is built from basically commodity hardware which is really really inexpensive uh, inexpensive machines that you can you can put together to kind of create a you know a big cluster of uh, of computation as opposed to uh, using high performance computers very very expensive computers that that are traditionally being used to uh, do uh, scientific uh, computing computing uh, in addition to that we've uh, we've used gpus for uh, for acceleration uh, we've uh, we've also done some work in uh, in fpgas uh, and uh, some of our, you know some of our uh, uh, engineers and scientists have actually worked on uh, on actually building the foundation for what is uh, what is what i mentioned earlier which is uh, domain specific uh, uh, hard hardware architecture in all of this one of the things that is common uh, common is that you know when when we are when scientists are doing science uh, they are uh, they collect data they've uh, they curate the data they uh, they filter the data and only keep you know to keep interesting uh, interesting observation uh, on top of that there are there are other things that that they uh, they need to do uh that is they they need to clean the data they need to fill in some missing gaps that might be uh, that might be there in, uh, within the data they need to ensure that the data is being ca calibrated in a way that you know uh, that reflects the the instruments that that were used to collect it then they have to perform the analysis which is which is the meat of the problem and to help them do that and to guide them uh, they need to be able to visualize what what uh, what all goes in there and this entire process is uh, you know can be imagined as a like a pipeline 
And for that, uh, we are now going to talk about, or Justin is rather going to talk, describe the work that he has uh, done in, in the field of radio astronomy, uh, where we've built a pipeline, do what I just told you. With that, uh, Justin, over to you. Thank you, Rajesh. So in this part, we would be talking about uh, the MECAD absorption line survey and the pipeline which we built uh, to support that survey, processing of data in that survey. Before we begin, uh, let's uh, look into some basics of radio astronomy. Now, astronomical observations can be done across the entire wavelength of the electromagnetic waves, and you have which all includes the visible part, uh, which is captured using the optical telescopes. Then you have the radio part, uh, for which you need special apparatus to capture it, mostly dishes and antennas. The clarity of the image uh, or the resolution of the image captured uh, depends entirely on the surface area of the capturing uh, device in comparison to the wavelength that is trying to capture. So when it comes to optical telescopes, you can actually capture a really good image by building a fairly large enough uh, lens. It will capture a really high resolution image because the wavelength that is uh, taken into consideration here is in the range of one micrometer to 10 micrometer. That's a small, I mean, below one micrometer. It's a small area. But when it comes to radio waves, uh, the non-visible part, the wavelength is pretty large. It's 10 meter to one kilometer and larger than that. So building such a large uh, aperture or a capture area becomes, uh, capturing area becomes really impractical structurally. To solve this problem, uh, what researchers came up with is a method known as aperture synthesis, where they combine two dishes to kind of form a larger capturing surface. Now, imagine a scenario where you have multiple dishes spread across the entire area, and these dishes, the pairs of them, can now capture across multiple wavelengths uh, in multiple resolutions. And in the end, the captured data kind of is a four-dimensional data where uh, the, the observation is done across time and across multiple baselines and each of these baselines uh, capturing multiple frequencies. And once this information is captured, uh, the images are generated from these uh, radio waves using Fourier transforms. Next, we come to the MALS ecosystem, uh, which comprises of a database, which is uh, used to catalog uh, previous uh, observations and information about uh, the future observations which is linked to the pipeline, processing pipeline, uh, which is responsible for cleaning up the data and producing the images. Now the generated images are uh, passed through a diagnostic process, which uh, helps the investigators do quality checks and quality assurance on the generated artifacts. And these generated artifacts are then sent to the archival system, uh, which then helps them to do public releases and for future references. The first section is the database section. Now, radio astronomical observation is just like any other science experiment, and it consists initially, the first step is uh, the literature survey part. And in radio astronomical terms, a literature survey would entail the researcher having to go through the existing survey data. For the MALS survey, uh, NDSS survey is used as the base, uh, base survey from which sources of interest can be identified. Once the data is collated uh, and researchers collaborate on, uh, have gone through them, they collaborate with each other to identify sources of interest. Now, sources can be any astronomical entity like a galaxy or a star. And once a source is selected, it is sent over to the observatory for observation and data collection. Now, the collected data comes back in a raw format uh, with the pri primary cleaning being done at the uh, telescopes end or the data observatory end. And when it once it arrives in back into the system, uh, then it is sent for the data processing, which is done via the pipeline. And the data processing generates some images and artifacts, which then goes through a quality check cycle to make sure that, uh, I mean, if there are any discoveries to be made, if the artifacts have been generated properly, are there any errors during the processing, the pipeline processing stage? And once uh, the quality assurance has been done, uh, it is sent to the artifact storage from which, uh, you know, parts of it after uh, going thoroughly through the observations can be released to the public for their consumption. 
The A3 system is hosted in in-house servers in Ayuka and it enables researchers to collaborate with each other. Uh, the overall system design includes uh, Python Flask as the API layer, React as the front end, and they are dockerized and it's a dockerized build which is deployed every time. The database layer is uh, written in Postgres, which uh, contains the catalog, the existing survey catalogs, and uh, the inner routing is done with the help of Nginx. Next, we come to the pipeline, uh, or RTIP as we call it, the Automated Radio Telescope Imaging Pipeline. So before we get into the pipeline, I want to go around with a question for the need of a pipeline. So I start with uh, GMRT. Uh, it is a radio observatory located in Pune. It had 30 antennas uh, and it would capture around 10 GB of data for per one hour. And a researcher could go through that data in three hours and come up with findings and observations. Now the next generation is the Meerkat, the telescopes used for the Meerkat absorption line survey, which kind of generate two terabytes of data per every one hour. That's kind of hundred fold jump in the uh, amount of data that is generated. And finally, the next generation that comes up is the SCAR. So Meerkat is a precursor to SCAR. And SCAR is going to generate around seven petabytes of data per one hour of observation. Now, as we can see, uh, it becomes non-practical to do a manual processing of this uh, amount of data. And a need for pipeline emerges from just the sheer volume of observation that these devices or these observatories are putting forward. And hence, uh, Hence, the entire RTIP idea was born and uh, the pipeline was designed. So the pipeline. The major processes which are done or done as part of this pipeline is the data cleaning, calibration, imaging, and the post-processing. So the first stage is uh, data cleaning and calibration. Now, whenever an observation is done, there is a high probability that one of the antennas might misbehave. Or, uh, you know, I'm listening for a specific uh, wavelength and an aeroplane passes by. It creates an interference. This might be repeated every day. I mean, the flight timings are kind of fixed. So it happens every day. So I know that given this time interval, my observation is a bad, bad observation or given this antenna, everything that this antenna has captured is bad. Or given this antenna and every other pair this antenna forms with, that entire information is bad. Again. So the first step is data cleaning or data flagging. And we flag across uh, these uh, dimensions. So if we flag in time, uh, we flag across uh, antennas. There is also probability that uh, there is a uh, you know TV broadcast being done on a specific frequency, which kind of clashes with the uh, observation frequency or observation wavelength. So I also know that one particular frequency is also bad. So once I have cleaned the data, I have removed these bad sections out of data, then we go to the calibration stage. When an observation is made, uh, there is no guarantee that the, you know, the values that it is capturing is same across every day because the atmospheric patterns change and the information that reaches down to the antenna changes every day. So we need a way to boost the signal or calibrate it uh, across every day so that we have a uniform observation. And to do that, we have multiple calibrators. We have the flux calibrator, flux or the intensity calibrator. Then we have the phase calibrator, which is uh, responsible for correcting the phase of observation. And finally, we have the target calibration. So the way it follows is, uh, so scientists or researchers have already identified well-known sources in the sky. And during every scan, the antenna kind of points to that well-known source, then looks back at the target, then points back to that source. And this process is repeated so that, you know, there are multiple data points through which I can calibrate my observation. For flux calibrator or the intensity calibrator, uh, we take the known value of the flux, which we have already known from that source because it's a well-known source. And then we take the current value of the flux which the antennas have uh, you know, read by focusing on that source. The difference is then calibrated to correct uh, for this uh, intensity loss. Then we come to the phase correction. We have phase calibrators and the same process is repeated. We know what exactly the value of the phase should be for that uh, source. 
we look at what value we are getting now and we correct it. And once we have uh, kind of identified the calibration values, we apply it to the target which we are reading. And that kind of provides us with the right values for that particular target. Now we come to the imaging stage. Now there is a high probability that multiple sources are uh, observed during the same cycle of observation and the data consists of multiple such target sources. Now the first step in the imaging process is uh, selecting which, uh, which source is to be used to generate the image. Now that post the selection of the source, we come to the continuum image uh, generation stage where an average image is generated. As I had mentioned earlier, the observation is done across multiple frequency channels. The continuum image is generated by uh, performing a Fourier transform on the average values across these, free, uh, these frequency channels. The process then is repeated multiple times until a clear bright source image, bright image is not uh, generated. Then comes the second part of the process, which is a spectral line imaging. In this, uh, the entire frequency channel is split into multiple spectral windows and uh, the same process, Fourier transform is done on each of these uh, you know, spectral windows and an image is generated. Then the final post-processing stage comes where we extract a spectral, uh, you know, spectral plot for the source. So using the continuum image, we identify the bright spot uh, in the source. And at the bright spot, uh, we look at the entire frequency band and we take out the values at that particular pixel position or at that particular RA deck or the space sky coordinates. And the spectral plot gives us a lot of information about the source which we are observing. So these spectral plots contain emission patterns or absorption patterns, which are uh, kind of tied to the chemical reaction uh, which the underlying elements uh, which compose that source goes through. And each of the elements have their own specific uh, frequencies at which these uh, absorptions or emissions occur, which helps a researcher to kind of identify at what stage of development the current source, which is under observation, is in. Now we come to the RTIP modules. The first one is the calibration module, which is responsible for calibrating the data. The input is the raw MS file. No and the output is the calibrated target sources. Multiple, if there are multiple, it would be multiple target sources. The second is the RTIP quant, which is responsible for generating the continuum image. And it also does self calibration uh, and the output is a continuum image. The third, uh, third module is the RTIP queue. The input is the calibrated sources and the output is a spectral line across all the spectral windows and the line image or the cube image which it generates. And finally, we have the RTIP diagnostic which uh, takes artifacts from each of these stages, calibration stage, uh, continuum stage and the uh, you know, cube imaging stage. And what it does is it generates multiple visualizations which enables the researchers to kind of come to a conclusion whether they're data processing in that particular stage was a success or were, was there something missing uh, while was there something wrong while the data processing was done. Now this entire system can be controlled you, with the help of a web app, which we call the pipeline manager. The responsibility of the web app is uh, practically to manage configurations for each of these pipeline, to manage artifacts and to design the entire experiment flow. So within a single experiment, you can have uh, multiple continuum images being generated, multiple uh, RTIP cubes being run and multiple diagnostics being run. Overall, the web app is written in Python Flask uh, as the API layer and React as the front end. And it is enabled with a capability to run parallel jobs in a, a server with a cluster server. We use CASA uh, as the underlying API layer to process the data and uh, PyBDSF to, to do the diagnostics. Now we come to the discoveries. So using this pipeline, uh, the lead researcher was able to uh, perform a discovery which, which he claims would have been missed out if it were done using a manual processing. 
and this discovery uh, kind of tells about the origin of universe it it kind of leads towards that and finally to the publications uh, as part of artif itself we have had multiple publications and uh, we have written some insight articles as part of uh, dic data intensive computing and reconfigurable domain specific architecture and that brings us to the end of the presentation uh, we are open for questions thanks thanks very much to both of you to justin and rajesh for a great talk yeah, thanks for um, bearing with um, small technical glitches that happens. But yeah, now is a great time for you to share questions. So please feel free to um, place them in the chat. Otherwise, you two explained um, so well that there are no questions. It was all very clear. All right, we have a question from PG. How much data have you accumulated so far? Part of months, I think there has been uh, like a I think there are 20 observations done and each of them kind of close to four uh, terabytes of data as of now. So comes close to 80 terabytes of data as of now. I mean, the number would be more. Uh, so this is from uh, the last time I checked. So it's 80 terabytes. All right. Well, um, we'll, we'll give it a minute and see if there's any other questions popping in the chat. I just will take this opportunity to thank um, our speakers today, Justin and Rajesh, for an awesome talk. And ah, yeah, okay, we do have another question from PG, so I'll read that now. And if you have a question you would love to share, please, as I said, um, it would be great if you could write that in the chat. All right, so the question is, where do you store the data? No on NVMe, I guess? In the, so, so uh, Justin talked talk about where uh, currently the pipeline has been implemented, and that's, uh, that's in the data center currently uh, sitting uh, at uh, what we know as Ayuka. Uh, and the data center currently has machines uh, that are still a little bit old. So uh, we still got this uh, data setting on, on hard disk uh, drives at the moment. Uh, Justin, correct me, correct me if I'm wrong over there. Uh, yes, it's uh, hard drives and they have a luster FS underlying which connects them across all the clusters. So that is how they manage as of now. Right. Uh, with the uh, with India being a participant in the Square Kilometer Array uh, uh, program, uh, we uh, this is uh, one of the one of the regional science centers uh, that will do the processing would be uh, would be located in India. And for that, uh, uh, I think I think those are the places play. That's the place where uh, the current architecture looks like uh, uh, where we would we would be using. Uh, uh, NVMEs for uh, for data uh, data storage. Uh, so that's yes yet to happen. So we are we are still we I think uh, uh, in terms of technology we are still catching up uh, catching up there. The prototype data center, however, in uh, for uh, SK in uh, in Shanghai that was built was 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 completely designed with uh, uh, NVMe as as their uh, storage uh, storage media. How could new subprocessors like Cerebra's highly integrated multiple CPU and RAM on very large chip reduce latency and data processing speed? Okay, I'm going to take a stab at trying to uh, trying to answer uh, and try to answer that. Uh, and this is uh, this is again going back to uh, domain specific uh, domain specific uh, hardware architecture where. Uh, where currently, I think in, in traditional computer systems, uh, I think our bottlenecks uh, are primarily the I/O. Right? Uh, there, uh, if it's an x86 based system, uh, we know that we have a limited the thing and the fastest uh, I/O lanes that we can get um, are um, uh, are the PCIe uh, and drive generation four, uh, which are several uh, gigabits per second, if I'm not mistaken. Right? And and here's here's where the uh, where some of these uh, problems lie, and specifically uh, uh, problems that uh, problems that actually hit uh, uh, arithmetic intensity of less than one, where for every single uh, uh, you know operation that you are actually performing uh, the the processing application the uh, operation that you are performing on a on a byte of data. Uh, you are performing more than a few operations on uh, on the reads and writes to the I/O. Um, here is where uh, I think system on chip or uh, you know uh, 
specifically uh, hardware designed for this would allow uh, data to be transferred between peripherals, between let's say a uh, GPU and uh, and a high bandwidth uh, memory, or whether it's your ten tensor processing unit and your uh, NDS storage. Here is where uh, I believe that these uh, uh, you know the the high IO would actually bring about uh, bring about better uh, faster faster data processing. So I, I hope that that answered your question. Thank you. All right, we've got a few more coming up in the chat. So PG is asking a clarifying question. Do you really mean NVMe for petabytes of data? Uh, sorry, can you, can you repeat that again? I'm reading directly from the chat and I'm not fami familiar sorry. with the terms. So <laughs> I'm not sure if I, I might be mispronouncing them like wildly too. So, but um, it was... Oh. Oh, um, uh, do you really mean N for do you really mean NVMe for petabytes of data? Right. So, so there is a current limitation uh, with uh, I if I understand the question correctly is that uh, yeah are you serious about uh, you know that about using NVMe for storing petabytes of data? Um, yes. So this is uh, so definitely there is uh, uh, in terms of in terms of where uh, the whole uh, uh, Industry is going with data storage, and uh, specifically with high density uh, density storage. Uh, it it is moving towards uh, non volatile memory express, particularly for the operations where they need that kind of an IO. Right, if you have operations that are are doing a high rate of reads and writes from your uh, from your uh, uh, storage, uh, the hard drives and the SSDs are just not going to cut it. Uh, having said that, there are there are several limitations, and some of these limitations are uh, are something uh, uh, we're going to have to live with for a time. One of them is the extreme high cost of uh, non-volatile memory express uh, storage, uh, and the second is the low uh, densities. Right? To today, we can you know with uh, you have hardware densities of ten terabytes, uh, which are in available in commodity uh, hard drives. Uh, and you can get that get that in a single single drive. However, I think really expensive and VMEs have reached just about uh, uh, sixteen or uh, you know uh, sixteen or less uh, terabytes. And these are these are still something that you know the industry is producing not not as commodity hardware, but more as more as something to as a demonstration of uh, of technology. So yes, there are uh, there are limitations with. Uh, using and VME for petabyte scale storage. Thank you. All right, we have a question from S. Narazima. I'm sorry if I uh, hopefully pronounced that close to correctly. Okay, the question is the rules for data intensive computing, few of them seem to be similar to the thought process in big data space. Is there an overlap between the understandings of the two areas or are, or are they different? Also, is it not possible to use some popular tools in data space that are currently used, like Apache Spark? I'll I, I probably am better equipped to uh, answer the second uh, question first. <laughs> uh, and Justin, please, uh, please jump in, uh, jump in over here. Uh, uh, Spark Hadoop uh, subsystem, yes, uh, yes to. Uh, it is it is a form uh, it is a form of uh, you know one I would say implementation of the what we expect to see in a data intensive uh, architecture. Um, however, uh, again having said that, uh, I think we are limited in terms of uh, in terms of what types of uh, algorithms and what what types of compute can be actually uh, can can be actually done on that. Uh, Map produces, of course, something that we are all we are probably familiar with, and at least I'm. I'm uh, familiar with. Uh, I think the uh, I think uh, I mentioned one point before, and that is uh, that is why we need to revisit uh, the algorithm, some of the algorithms that uh, that are that we are currently using. And those uh, algorithms are uh, don't lend themselves to uh, uh, parallelization very very uh, easily. Um, just to give you an example, uh, you might have something like a fast Fourier transform, um, uh, and uh, uh, fast Fourier transform may, uh, you know, uh, to, 
to a certain extent can be this thing parallelized, you still have intermediate uh, data interchange that needs to happen uh, before you know before you actually get the uh, uh, reach the uh, right, the result. And so while yes, uh, you've got uh, existing tools that can be used for certain class of problems. Uh, when it comes to uh, specific, again, and this is very domain specific uh, uh, problems like radio astronomy, you might have to rethink uh, right, or rewrite some of the algorithms that are used. I I forgot what the first question was, but Justin, if you want to take a stab at that, please please do. I would not be best suited to answer that. It's mostly around big uh, big data uh, computing. All right. Uh, yeah, I, I suppose there are parallels, parallels in what uh, Jim Gray's uh, rules are. Uh, I think, I, I don't know what came first though, uh, because Jim Gray's papers might have, uh, uh, I, I, and I, I need to check that when uh, this was, uh, those those laws of uh, Jim, that of uh, data intensive uh, that Jim Gray laid out, uh, probably predate, uh, bef predate uh, before data, you know, big data actually become became a, a household term. But I'm not sure. Uh, take take my what I'm saying with a pinch of salt. Okay, thank you. All right, we have another question from PG. Another data question: How long do you archive experimental data if you never expire them? Good question. And uh, uh, again, to to answer this, I'm going to reach back into what. Uh, um, uh, I'm, I'm forgetting the name of the agency in the United States, uh, which actually deals with, uh, primarily deals with the uh, uh, scientific, scientific data, I think. It's, it's the National Science uh, Foundation. Uh, and much of, much of what has been kind of uh, coming in terms of data archival and the data archival systems for oceanographic data, uh, that's weather data, uh, and those have have are coming coming from uh, the guidance is coming from over there, and uh, there are there is of course uh, data that you can you know you can process you can get get uh, results and you can uh, you can probably uh, throw away the observations after after the uh, after you have got inferences from that. However, some of the data like meteorological data might be might be one of them or genomic data might be. Uh, might be something uh, something else, and I, I guess again it depends on the type of data, but uh, but those that kind of data appears to be one that needs to be long lived, uh, which means it uh, if not you know uh, it it at least needs to date several hundred years. And again, this is uh, this is something again I'm uh, you know reaching back into what what I've uh, read about from um, from some of the papers that have or some of the talks that have happened with the in the national science. Uh, foundation uh, is in the United States. Wonderful. Thank you. Those are all the questions. What I have to say. Yes, Justin. Uh, sorry, uh, I think there was a lag. So in astronomy, what I have known is they use legacy storage systems also to kind of archive data. So tape storage, uh, as long as the data need not be processed, can be kept on a tape storage, uh, which can then be retrieved, put into an active system, which can host uh, some fast IO to perform the compute. So that is also how an archival system, uh, the archival system which they use here. Oh yes, absolutely. And I think in, even in uh, terms of remote sensing data, satellite images, uh, uh, mostly I think about just about a year or two years of data worth of data is uh, actually kept online uh, for people to work on. Uh, rest of it is usually archived into some kind of a cold storage. Uh, including what you just mentioned, uh, Justin Tapes. Great. Thank you both. All right. Well, this brings us to the end of our event today. Just want to thank our speakers for the great talk today. And thank you all our joiners today for um, being here and also patience for any technical issues. And a big shout out to the whole E4R team. We have several people in the call today. So thank you for all your, your work. And it's been a pleasure hosting um, this talk series. So yeah. Thanks, everyone. Wishing you a good rest of your day. Thank you. And thanks, Stephanie.